Good afternoon and welcome to the Firefish Recruitment Crowdcast. My name is Matt Jelly. What do recruiters have to be positive about right now? Well, to answer this question, I'm delighted to introduce our special guest today, uh, Mr. James Osborne, who is chairman of the Recruitment Network and chairman of TRN World, um, which is a portal that brings recruitment leaders together, sharing events, sharing content and much, much more. James, good afternoon. How are you? I am very, very good, Matt. How are you doing? Very well, thank you. Very well indeed. Very well indeed. Um, so, James, let's get straight to the heart of the matter. Um, the recruitment industry has been hit hard by COVID recently. Um, it's been a difficult time. Um, but have you noticed any positives that have come out of all of this and this terrible situation that we've been in? No, it's been absolutely awful. No, only joking. It's... Um... <laughs> It's one of those things. The it's an incredible situation that we're in. It's an extraordinary situation, that, and no one's ever been through anything like this before. Um, in such a way, it's, it's it's sort of manifesting itself. Um, so there's a lot of bad stuff going on, a lot of negativity. Totally understand that, and I'm not going to belittle the sort of the fates and plights of a lot of people out there, key workers, people who've lost friends and families and that type of stuff. It's very sad, and you know that will carry on. I'm sure for a, a lot longer to come yet. So. That bit aside, if we focus back on what it does do from a positive point of view, it's yeah. to me it changes everything. It changes everything about our industry. It changes everything about how we think about our industry. It changes our opportunity to evolve our industry into maybe what it should have been a number of years ago. Um, and I'm very excited, um, albeit with a pragmatic slant on this, of where the industry is going to end up after this. Um, I think we have an, an amazing opportunity now to rewrite how recruitment is done, how relationships are formed with customers, how we engage with people, how we do business. Um, I find that incredibly exciting um, and something that I hope the industry, I hope recruiters, I hope recruitment leaders embrace um, and take forward out of this because I think it will make us a far better industry, far better businesses. Uh, we should come out of this fitter, stronger, leaner, better um, because of it, albeit we would have rather come out of it in a different way or got through it to, to a different way. So I'm really positive about that. I think, it's, I think there's a good opportunity here for us as an industry if we take it. Okay, fine. And that's really interesting and generally a very positive response. And I know that you've uh, put together recently and published a 12-point plan for recruitment leaders and what they should be looking at right now. We'll talk about that maybe a bit later because some really interesting points within that. But sort of leading on from your initial response and that being one of um, – well, excitement to a certain extent then about, you know, what, what things could be happening within the industry. I mean, I know that your slogan is indeed, you know, making a positive difference for the recruitment industry. Um, you know, what, spe what specific ways do you think that the recruitment industry needs help to change? Yeah, I think the, it's one of those situations, right? The, um, as an industry, this is a massive generalization and sweeping statement, but I'm going to throw it out there anyway, because we've spoken to, I mean, we're talking hundreds and hundreds of recruitment leaders over the course of the last nine to 10 weeks. We've got very close to a lot of businesses, some businesses that we've never worked with before, some that we know very well. There is no doubt in my mind that a couple of trends that were careering their heads anyway leading into this have been fast-tracked and been expedited now because of what's happened. And I think these trends are actually really positive trends. I think number one, as an industry and, and a lot of recruitment businesses, whilst they are growing and have grown and doing very well, very well, I think as an industry, a lot of recruitment companies are very uh, unprofitable um, in comparison to what they could be. They can still make profits, don't get me wrong, and they still grow. Um, but I think we're nowhere near as profitable as we could be. We spend a lot of time as an industry, if you think about it, working in a very much a contingent arm's length supplier relationship type approach, um, which means that a lot of the work we end up doing, we never actually get paid for. A lot of the effort we put in, we never really see a return for that effort. Um, I think that's going to change because of this. It has been changing over the last couple of years. We spent a lot of time working with recruitment companies, helping them build a far better partnership relationship with customers as opposed to a supplier relationship, uh, building embedded products where it's more a lot closer to supporting and being a support mechanism for a company as opposed to being an external provider. So I think that's one thing that we're starting to see happening a lot more, getting that piece right. I think around that, you've got, there's always been a fixation in any industry for that matter around headcounts and revenue and turnover. And these are all things along the top of the surface, which actually are fairly meaningless when it comes down to 
and running a great business. And I think what we've realized more than ever before now, a lot of people have realized, is that your true profitability is significantly important and probably more important than how many headcount you've got, what your turnover is, what your GP is. There's some amazing businesses out there at the moment who are actually doing reasonably well through this period. In fact, some are doing very well for this period, and not because they've got the biggest turnover, not because they've got the biggest headcount, but actually because they've got the most profitable machine running in their business. They are fixated on dropping contribution, EBITDA, yield on everything they think about and everything they do. And I think that's really exciting. We talk a lot about in that 12 point plan around the bottom up approach about how you build a strategy in your business based on dropping profit first and foremost. And how do you create that level of profit? Not how do we get a load of people on board, do a load of business, and hopefully that will generate some profit at the end. It's a very different way of thinking. So I think that's really exciting. And I think that's something we can make a big difference to as well. And I think the, the, the last part comes into a little bit around the relationships we're now having with our, with our customers. And you and I laughed about this earlier on. You know, we, we do talk about this. We are hanging out in our customers' bedrooms. We, we have met their children. Their pets have come flying in and that type of stuff. We have never been so closer to our customers um, the barriers between business and, and humans has just been decimated because of this process. And I think that is a really, really good thing because all of the, the rubbish that we wrap sales in and recruitment in and all that sort of stuff has just disappeared. It's gone back to the pure basis of there is a person at the end in front of me who's got pain, got pains, got challenges, got problems, got emotions, and we're going to work together to fix and solve that. That is what selling is. That is what recruitment is. Uh, the fact that we have to be doing this now because of what's going on, I think is really, really supportive of that. So I think we're getting a lot closer to people now as well. And that is great. And they ask a question, I don't know, from, a, from a performance point of view, I, I used to talk to recruiters and recruitment companies and say, you know, how many client meetings do you do? We talk about being a personal in, industry. How many times do you actually go and see your customers? And it's like, oh, if we, if we do three or four a month, we'll be on a good wind and that type of stuff. I don't know about you, I'm doing like 12 to 13 client meetings a day at the moment because I'm sitting in front of this screen all day long having back-to-back -back Zoom meetings. Is that any different from touching the flesh of them? Maybe it's not quite as good, but it's damn more efficient. So all of these things are great things. If we embrace this, we can really do some great stuff with it. Okay, so let's look at that relationship element um, for, for a minute. And you're talking about changing the model, your business model at the moment, and those companies that are successful are the ones that have in some way, some way uh, being able to sort of turn it upside down to an extent. Um, relationships between your recruiters and the clients then going forward, is it going to be better? Is it going to be worse? Much better. So, well, well, much better if you want it to be much better. It's tough, up to us to utilize it. So, you know, I think we've got an opportunity here to uh, throw away the rule book, uh, throw away the rules of how selling is done and how camp management is done, all that type of stuff. And we have an opportunity now to change that completely. And I think some people have done this for, over the course of this period, over this last seven, eight weeks, we have had some of the members of the recruitment network, some of the consultants in the business, some of the industry, a lot of the industry, have literally been spending far, far more time with their customers than they've ever done before. That is brilliant if you think about it, because suddenly we're starting to really understand our customers. We're understanding what their critical hiring plans are going to be for the next 12 months. We're helping our customers re-engineer their talent strategies. We've never had the chance to do those conversations before. We've been too busy just trying to got any jobs, got any jobs, trying to fill some jobs. So let's talk about your business. And then what we're starting to see now because of that is the wins that are coming through now over this period. And that's definitely picked up recently, which really excites me. Mm -hmm. is that a lot of the wins that are coming through are far more retained relationship opportunities. They're far more long-term contractual stuff. It's like, actually, Matt, you've been great over this period. Let's work together now moving forward because we can do something really interesting together because we've really understood each other. Okay, and, and you obviously speak to a lot of companies, a lot of business leaders um, on an ongoing basis. You know, in practice, how, how much is that happening? Because out there, you know, equally, people are in survival mode. People are struggling to stay optimistic. So I yeah. suppose, you know, two questions there, you know, how much is that practically and in, in reality happening? Um, and secondly, for those that are struggling to find uh, resilience and stay optimistic, you know, what advice would you give to them there? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so with any strategy, right, you've got, you can't be overtly optimistic and have your head in the clouds. There's a reality which is, comes first, which is around avoid all the distractions, stay focused, survival first. There's no point having a business strategy with lots of 
ideas and pie in the sky ideas if you're not around in six months time to see that through. So everyone in recruitment today needs to have a survival plan that they launched hopefully eight, nine, 10 weeks ago. They're midway through it now, it's working and they're managing their, that business. That doesn't change. We've still got a lot of challenges ahead of us. That's still going to manifest itself. So cash flow plans still need to be reforecasted week on week, moving forward at least a good nine to 12 months. We're not that crazy thing otherwise. So you've got to get your survival plans in place. But at the same time as you've got your survival plans in place, you've got to be thinking about what the market is going to look like at the end of all this and how we're going to come out the other side of this. And most importantly, how are you going to capitalize on this new way of working at the end of it? And I'm not saying the world is going to be completely different and we're not going to go back to offices or that type of stuff, but there is a massive chunk of the old habits that we used to do in recruitment that will disappear and go away. And if we hold on to it, we're just going to go back to our old habits. You think genuinely things are going to change? No, there's a lot of people trying to, and I think I'm, I'm feeling a little bit sad about some of it because there are, there are some people who are literally desperate to go back to the way it was before. This has changed a hell of a lot. It really, really has. And we've got to embrace that. But we're all desperate to go and see our friends. We're all desperate to get the sales for vibe back again. We're desperate to get back to our offices. Business leaders are desperate to get some return on that real estate that they've been sitting on for the last nine to 10 weeks and no one's been in. I get all that and totally understand. And there are elements of that which are spot on. But the way we're going to work is going to be different. People are going to expect to have more flexibility. We have learned over the last nine weeks as business leaders at last to trust our staff when we can't see them and touch the flesh. That's brilliant if you think about it because we've been forced to do it in, an, in a place where most people have never been able to trust their staff properly working remotely, which is why we've always had an environment of everyone coming to the office, 9 to 5, 8.30 to 5.30, show me your KPIs and your stats and your numbers. We've had to, our backs have been against the wall to say, right, everyone go home. I'm now going to trust you. We're going to work our way through this. That is being superb for the organizations have got that piece right. So I think that's great. I don't think we're going to change that. And people are going to expect to have more freedom, more flexibility. I personally am more efficient in, in the last nine weeks than I've ever been in my entire life. I've spent more time with my family over the last nine weeks than I have spent in decades. I'm fitter than I've ever been. Because I'm, as we were talking about, I'm running more than I've ever been running for. Why, why would I want to lose all that right now? Because actually, we're working fine. Well, well Jake, James, you are exceptionally fit, and m most people will be aware of that with your uh, Ironman antics and uh, regular running, absolutely. Um, but again, you know, in practice at the moment, do you see? Do, do you feel that that's the vibe that you know most people out there, you know, are wanting to have those flexible working practices in place? And you know, what are the positives and negatives of that going to be? Yeah, definitely. I think I think this is a great thing, right? The you know, a lot of people are trying to second guess what's going on. No one knows exactly what the future is going to look like. Um, I talk about this a lot, that we have the opportunity to create our futures. It's up to us to decide what the rule book's going to look like moving forward. And this is a great opportunity. So one of the first things that we did is that we went out to our team, and we've done this across a lot of the members of TRN, is basically put a survey out, talk to your staff. What do they want? What do they, what do they learn over this period about themselves, about productivity, about the way that they work, about their relationship with customers, about what they will want to do moving forward after this? I saw an example the other day of a recruitment leader who has spent the majority of the bank holiday weekend in their office, uh, making it look ready to go back to work for, you know, classic, lots of sticky tape everywhere and shower curtains up all over the place and all that type of stuff. And he'd spent hours doing it and it put a great effort in it and it looked brilliant and it would allow a third of his staff to come back again. So that was great, right? Um, and that's him holding on to that old history that he's got. He asked, all this, he did a video to his staff and said, basically, look, who wants to come back? How exciting, the office is ready to go. And none of them wanted to come back. Not one of these members of staff wanted to go back. They weren't ready to go back. They didn't want to go back. And now they're in a massive cultural clash between actually he's thinking, maybe my staff don't actually aren't loyal to my business after all the effort I put in. And they're going, I just don't feel comfortable right now going back to the office. And to be honest with you, I'm not on furlough. I'm working from home and I'm smashing it. So why do I need to go back to that old norm just because you've got a bit of real estate that needs filling? It doesn't make sense. And we've got to be really careful with this. OK, fine. And in fact, that sort of segues quite nicely into one of the questions that's just come out from the uh, the audience. Um, and this is from Viral. Um, and he has asked, how can recruiters manage the unreal expectations and challenges um, which can help in retaining uh, their jobs due to uh, due to COVID? Um, so basically, how can recruiters uh, manage the unreal expectations and challenges um, which um, 
can help in retaining their uh, their jobs uh, due to due to COVID. Um, yeah. so I think wherever else coming from at this um, at this point here is um, you know it, it's unreal situation out there at the moment, um, and you know people looking to retain retain their jobs is you know potentially a bit unreal and you know massive challenge. So you know how can re- recruiters address that? Yeah, I mean, I think if I understand the question right, Burrell, the, you know, well, one thing I'll say straight away, this is not a difficult situation we are in. This is a different situation we're in. They are two different things. And how you approach that is, is you will have a massive determining factor on how successful you are coming out the other side of this. There is no doubt in my mind the industry is going to shrink because of this. So there will be less recruiters in the market coming out of this at the back end of 2020, moving into 2021. There'll be more startups happening, and that will generally ha- generally happens in these environments. Um, but there'll be less recruiters out there typically. So that that's what what you've got. Consequently, the ones who are going to remain in the industry, the ones who are going to be successful in the industry, are the ones who can demonstrate the skills and traits that we require in this market moving forward. The market has flipped; it's more of a client-led market than it is a candidate-led market. So guess what? We're all going to have to be better salespeople again. Something that a lot of recruiters haven't had to do much of. Um, over the past couple of years because we've been flush with jobs. And it's more about the candidate piece. It's not a bad thing. It's just the reality of what it was. We're going to have to demonstrate the, the more skills around resilience, uh, more ability to be more consultative, to be able to have proper consultative conversations with our customers to help build not just win a bit of contingent business, but win proper embedded solutions, retain solutions, stuff that's going to make a positive difference to their business and uh, that we can charge more for, that we can ask for two, three, uh, 18 month contracts, two year contracts, and so on and so forth. Some of the things that we've been seeing happening across the network over the last nine to 10 weeks have been brilliant. So, now if you in any industry, if you want to keep your job as a recruiter or any job that you do, you've got to be in the top echelon of that industry. And the way to do that is identify what are the skills and traits of tomorrow's recruiter. And if you're on furlough now, for example, what an amazing nine, 10 weeks opportunity you've had to train yourself to become the best consultative recruiter, 360 recruiter, professional sorcerer, whatever you want to call yourself in tomorrow's market. That is amazingly exciting. Unfortunately, some people have used the furlough at time as an opportunity to paint their sheds two or three times and that type of stuff. And it's a wasted opportunity because we will never get this time again. That's why I'm excited about it. Because when was the last time in an industry that we've had a chance just to stop, just to reflect and just to re-engineer and rebuild? We've got that time now. Recruiters have that time now as well. I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Varel, but I hope that gives you some thoughts around that. No, I, I think I think it does, and um, I like to add there. You know, it's not a waste of time painting your shed. Obviously, if you're meeting your client in it, the uh, the, the the next the next week, etc. But it's uh, great. Uh, don't get me wrong on this one. So. Yeah, <laughs> I don't, I don't but in mm-hmm. response to that as well, you mentioned about 360 and obviously shifting and changing um, work practices potentially, and uh, you know how the recruiters will be. Uh, basically uh, operating and working. Um, a question also that's come in is, do you think the future recruitment agencies will have shifts or just focus on work when you like and focus on outcomes? So again, you know, looking, you know, you mentioned earlier as well about, um, you know, the new future, the new norm, you know, what's that, what's that going to look like? You know, None of us exactly know what it's going to look like. A few of us have got, you know, ideas on that. A lot of the talk at the moment is, well, it's going to be flexible. It's going to be 360 workers. But again, just to reiterate that question, which I think is very interesting, is, you know, do you think that the future recruitment agencies will have shifts or just focus on sort of work when you like um, and focus on outcomes? Okay, well, let, let's just think about the, in- ignoring what's happening today. Let's just think about the industry as an industry right so uh, i'm a recruiter i want to do some headhunting of of candidates uh, when's the best time to do headhunting well it's going to be sort of in the morning and at the end of the day when they're not in work number one so we should be on shifts anyway or we certainly should have an elongated time uh, great recruiters are the ones who are continuously rethinking about business and recruitment all the time that doesn't change whether you're on a shift or not on a shift whether you're nine to five or whatever we are always on it. I, I will take a call from a client at nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. In fact, I did this weekend, nine o'clock on a Saturday morning. A great recruiter would phone up a candidate at three o'clock on a Sunday afternoon to try and get them on board ready for Monday. That's what we do. That's what the traits of a great recruiter is all about. So will, will there be a shift pattern? Possibly there'll be flexibility around that. But I would hope businesses and smart recruiters will naturally use their time 
um, to focus their resource and their efforts at a time when they, they can get the most return, i.e., when is a candidate going to be available? When's the best time to talk to a, a client and so on and so forth? And and the piece going of- back to some of the things you were saying earlier, James, do you think that's something we can be excited about? Yeah, massively. Yeah, massively. I think there's the people. Tell me one person, that's I can tell you a couple, but most people in the world, um, would, if you said to me, I want to have a work life balance, I can't think there are many people who go, oh no, that's crazy. I'd much rather work my butt off until I die, sort of stuff. We all, especially over this period, we've realized we can have more of a work life balance. That is absolutely superb. Flexibility creates some form of work life balance. You've got to be sensible with it. You've got to be able to manage it. You've got to be able to uh, cleverly utilize data and metrics to make sure you can understand when is the good time and the bad time and who's putting shifts in and not putting shifts in. But the point that comes out, the second point on that question was around outcomes. And yeah. I think this is genius. And I love this. It's, we should be measuring recruiters on outputs and outcomes, not on bloody KPIs, which are some aspirational number that we pluck out of the air and hope it might work. We need to look at outcomes. That's what we reward and measure people on is outcomes. The data in our businesses that we use through data systems and software and everything else allows us to make better decisions to improve the outcomes. But we focus on the output and the outcomes. If we can start trusting our people more, which I think we are because of what's going on, then guess what happens? We can start to trust people to focus on their outcomes. We, our job is just to supply them with data and insights to be able to make better outcomes for them. So yeah, output focus massively. And let's flip it over now to our clients. Let's get our clients to be ch- um, spending more time focusing on the outputs we're creating. Not just our ability to place a candidate in a role, but what impact are we making to your business, Mr. and Mrs. Client? How much have we helped you improve the retention of your staff, which has cost your business? How much have we improved the performance of the candidates and of your business because of the quality of the candidates we're placing in your business, et cetera? All these things have a huge monetary value, which is an output of what we do. We only charge clients a fee, typically, for the placement of a candidate. We don't charge them for the impact our work makes to their business. That figure is significantly more which is why typically we've always been left at arm's length as a supplier as opposed to an embedded partner in their business. And that's crazy. And that's going to change. Okay, fine. And that, well, two questions very quickly, actually, if we, as part of the network, um, are you seeing that happen more and more? And two, um, is it therefore accelerating change that might be happening anyway? Yeah, it's, it's definitely been happening more and more. Everyone's been talking about it because people are just getting having enough. Last year, margins and pro- last year, margins, not so much margin, but certainly profitability was being squeezed. EBIT profitability was being squeezed. Also, it costs us more money to make a placement, and yet our margins don't seem to be going up, especially in a marketplace where it was all cans were driven. It's crazy. Supply yeah. and demand does not work like that, but yet we've let it work like that, which is sort of madness. So, yes, we've had enough of the fact that we're putting all this time and effort in. We're just not getting a good enough return on investment. That has been happening anyway. Some people have started to think about changing leading into COVID-19, thinking about maybe we need some better products to take to market, which are more embedded. And then guess what suddenly happened is that we suddenly been all been told to go home, got a lot of time to think about it and think, actually, when I come back out of this, do I want to go back and work with those same clients that I worked with yesterday who didn't really value what I did, weren't really paying for my services properly, and it was just hard work in some instances. And why would I want to work with them again? Either I flip them or guess what? I'm going to come back with them with a new product, a new opportunity, and a new way of working with them. That puts me at the same level as my customers. I'm not below my customers. I'm at the same level as my customers. And, and hey, look, we just had a question coming from Ben. Do you think that this is the moment that agencies can kill off the contingency recruitment model? Ooh, I think the contingency recruitment model will always be around. Um, I think it will always make up a large percentage of most recruitment companies' business. But I think any recruitment organization, any recruiter today that hasn't got a strategy in place to try and pivot away, or can I use the word pivot? Um, use, use pivot. It's been used quite a bit, but it's beautiful. I'm we don't use it anymore. I've been using it probably. Um, if, we're, if we haven't got a strategy in place that allows us to do more retained, and that, and that keeps changing, retain type business it doesn't have to be just retained by the way it could be anything that has an, an embedded relationship with the customer that creates some form of mrr monthly recurring revenue stream if you're doing that then you're on a, on a winning edge will it completely flip i don't think that will it's that has in some companies i know some companies just do purely retained i think it's a long way to go from that yet but think about it this way most recruitment companies who do perm 
are maybe at best 90% doing contingent, 10% retained. Imagine what would happen to your profitability, your figures, your conversion ratios, your engagement of your people, everything, if that was 70% on contingent and now 30% on the retained. It would transform everything to your profits just like that. You could forecast a lot better. You could plan your business a lot better. It's so much better. Okay. And again, you can see a trend going in that way um, as, as we go forward again. And I'm talking here about obviously the network and the people you're speaking to generally. The, the, the people I'm involved with, 100%, I'm going to bloody well make sure they do it because it's the right thing for them to do. And they know that. And they're all working through it. We've had a load of the members over the last 18 months anyway could be producing loads of new products. We've got two events running this week for our members, which is around how to sell different types of products, how to sell retainers, how to embed retainers into the business. Any of your guests want to come along to that, you're more welcome to watch the webinars. But the, yeah. the, these are all trends that are happening. It's obvious sort of stuff. It's much, much better business. So it's a great question to ask you. What actually is good business in recruitment? What makes a good customer? What makes a good bit of business? And yeah. ask yourself, how much of that have you been doing recently? Um, maybe pre-COVID-19. And then you've got a chance to change now if you want to. But you can't go to a market and go, hey, we do contingent recruitment. Now we've had a, a global pandemic. Now we're going to do something slightly different. Do you fancy doing retainers? And they're going to go, no, not really. Okay, okay, fine. That's not what we're talking about here. We're just talking about going back to the market now whilst they're thinking and planning about their businesses and their future of their businesses and saying, let's work with you to build a talent solution which is fit for purpose for the market, for what the market is going to change, how it's going to change, and that's going to make you more money, you more profitability, you more efficiency in your business. And guess what else it's going to do? It's going to make me as a recruiter, your recruiter, more money as well. I'm going to be far more engaged working with you and you're going to get everything from it. Okay. And that, I mean, that's an important point, a massively important point, because there's going to be recruitment businesses out there wondering how to do that going forward, wanting to do that. But, you know, how do they do that? And, you know, what recommendations would you give? How, how do you think that that will actually look? Because, you know, people might not be used to, you know, selling that way. Yeah. yeah. So, so the, the, first, well, the first immediate question, just for the sake of the timing point of view, is if ever, everyone here goes on to trmworld.com, it's completely for free. Third line down on the home page is a webinar I produced about it. It's pre-recorded. Just help yourself to that. Just log in, help yourself, and you can watch as much as you like, and it will show you how to do it. The the, the second piece around the um, the way to, what you've got to understand is the language and terminology we've used in years in recruitment is being thrown out the window. We use the words, we throw around the words RPO and software as a service and talent as a service and statement of works. We like to come up with new acronyms all the time and that type of stuff. They're all the same bloody thing at the end of the day. They're all pretty much the same sort of uh, bastardization, amalgamation of the same sort of thing. So create your own product, create a product that is fit for purpose for your market, for your customers' needs uh, and for what you're capable of delivering back to the marketplace. Call it what you like, stick a little trademark symbol next to it and crack on with it. It doesn't matter. I'd probably call it as a service because everyone else seems to be doing that right now. That seems to be the way to do it. Um, but, you know, design your own products. But have a look on Tierra World. Help yourself. There's loads of stuff on there to be able to do that. Okay, fine. And I think there's going to be a lot of people out there looking for stuff to read about that and strategy and sort of training potentially around that as well, which could be interesting. Um, mm. it, it's sort of leading on from that. Another question from Heidi. Well, a question, another question. And this one is from Heidi. Um, so getting into the specifics of it, really. So what do you think is a fair fee now? You know, and again, what Heidi's saying is we've always worked at around 25, 23 or, you know, even down to 20 um, and still walking away from lower. Um, and that's the key point here, isn't it? They're still walking away from lower. Um, but, you know, we know we're losing some briefs. Um, yeah. the, game is, the game is changing out there. What's your view on that, James? Yeah, the game is changing. I think this is not the time to be dropping margins and fees right now. We're seeing it in, in some areas. I think that's crazy. That's a shortfall, disastrous strategy to have. Um, you've got to stay true to your figures, you're true to your margins, you're true to your numbers. I think spend you're going to miss out on these briefs. The number of briefs coming in and, you know, if you're not chopping the fees, how are you going to get the briefs? Yeah, but you want, to work, you want good business. This whole COVID-19 thing is passing, yeah? We know that. We're seeing a bounce back already. We know that for a fact. So the market will go... This is a very uncomfortable, but it is a blip of some description, and we will come back the other side. If you come out the other side in a marketplace that you've created that is low margin business, albeit you're still frantically putting in the same Rolls Royce effort into that, then you're going to end up with a less profitable business moving forward, and you don't need to do that. We've got to flip our thinking away from the cost of a product 
into the return and value, return on investment and value of a solution. They're two completely different things. But, you know, we can't be pitching to customers and having conversations to customers about margins. I can show an organization, a proper customer organization, the impact my recruitment services can make to their business. And I can promise you now it's a hell of a lot more than two or three percent margin and the value to them if you can demonstrate that. But we never talk about that. We never prove the impact we make to our customers. We never talk about the retention impact. We never talk about the quality piece that comes from it. We just basically say, this is our price. Do you want to buy? And they go, well, no, we can get it cheaper up the road. All right, well, I'll, I'll match that then with the view that maybe you might want to use me in the future. Rubbish. It's, it's so hard to get a margin and then go back up higher on that margin, trying to negotiate back up again. So instead, focus on the good quality business. I was on a conversation with a call with someone this morning, recruitment business leader, who basically need to analyze their business. And I can guarantee it now, if they got rid of 60% of their client base, this is going pre-COVID-19, they got rid of 60% of their client base and just focus on that 40% and did twice as much work with that 40%, which they had, but they didn't have time to do it because they're too busy with the other 60%, they would have made three times more profitability, three times more profitability, for less work with less clients. Now, yes, we can argue that's risky because you're putting all your eggs in one or two baskets, sure. But if it's embedded, locked in business, two-year contracts, then maybe it's not as risky as you thought it is. And then you've got the ability to carefully forecast and plan how to grow back out of that. So my answer to your question is keep your margins tight as hell. If anything, they should be going up because you're delivering a better quality service. And we're going to be delivering less of a contingent supply relationship and more of a partnership relationship where we can do more for your business, much, much more for your business. Excellent. So Heidi, hopefully that helps. Certainly stand firm, stand strong and um, stand by the value of the uh, the service and the product. Um, James, fantastic. Thank you for that. That um, that hopefully answers Heidi's question. Another one, another couple actually that have come in. So I'm going to going to get them in if that's all right, James. Um, so this is from Rude um, and I'll read it out to you. The Microsoft of this world offered work from home in the past, but recently made a U-turn by asking people to be at work. The reason is that the ball got dropped somewhere, networking down the corridor, recruiter, staff retention, productivity. Your view on finding a workable solution? Maybe this is a, a mix of what we've been talking about. But. Yeah, there was, there was a, um, a comment that someone made on social media a couple of weeks ago. I can't remember what it was, but the, um, we're talking about work with the work from home solution. I think what people have got to realize is the work from home solution we are currently in is not the work from home solution of tomorrow. So I've still got a couple of kids out there still stealing my bandwidth or my broadband and still going to pop in every two minutes and all that type of stuff. I haven't got to get up and drive them to school, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The world's quite different right now. We're in an interim period. So the work from home solutions that the Microsofts of this world and companies of this world are going to be a different solution in tomorrow's market. So we've got to think about what tomorrow will look like once kids do eventually go back to school. Um, and once businesses start to evolve again, and et cetera, et cetera, once half of your workforce might be back out in London, et cetera. So I think it's a different work from home piece. Um, what's a workable solution? You know, the thing, the thing you've got to remember here is, let, let's go back 10 weeks ago. 10 weeks ago, we were all carrying on as business as usual. Suddenly somebody said, all right, everybody stop. Everybody bugger off home, figure it out. And that's what we had to do. And guess what happened? We all panicked a little bit. Then we all settled down and we all figured it out. And guess what? Over the last nine to 10 weeks, I've seen a lot of amazing businesses and amazing people not only figure it out, but actually really excel over this period. And I think that is amazing stuff. We've now got a chance to develop and evolve into what we want to be going forward. If it was a typical recession or a downturn, you get a bit of a notice period. They give you a few weeks notice. So you're going to go through into a bit of a downturn. We just got hit just like that. And we've worked it out and we've got on with it. I guarantee it now we will work out the next stage of this and the next stage and the next stage. And we will get on with it. We'll evolve and we will change. And we will even forget what it was like nine, ten weeks ago. I don't remember what it's like to go to my office. Not a big deal, really. I'm too busy focusing on this. So the work from home solution that Microsoft have today will be a different work from home solution from tomorrow. We, we've now we've got a chance to map that out and build that out, and make it work. And, and define it ourselves to a certain extent, as you're saying. And um, as a result... Well, be, be positive about that. So that's uh, so that's that's great. Um, okay, James. A, a, another question that's come in, and it overlaps a bit with what we were talking about earlier, but it is from uh, from Tim. Uh, what is the best format 
of fee structure for winning retained assignments in your experience? Yeah, so the, the, the old school way of retain was always a third of a third of a third, right? That was the old classic sort of thing. That's not, a, to me, that's not the point of what a retainer is. A retainer is there predominantly, unless you need it for cash flow, which hopefully you shouldn't need it for cash flow. Um, a retainer is predominantly there to get full and unbiased commitment from your customers is what it's about. Exclusivity in recruitment doesn't exist because I can be exclusive with you, but then mate over here drops me a CV. I'm going to have a look at it. So retainer demonstrates absolute commitment. So the managing number of the retainer needs to equate to what you think would be enough to keep them away, keep that customer uh, engaged with you, to allow them to let you into their offices and meet, talk to the hiring managers properly to get proper job specs, all that sort of good stuff, and do proper strategy stuff. It doesn't need to be a third of a fee. It potentially could be a lot less than that, but enough to basically mean they're not going to go and look elsewhere. The, the other side to it, though, is that there's, a, there's different types of retainers. You've got to understand that there's obviously spot retainers, but the, the thing that I'm really enjoying and we're doing a lot of at the moment is these rolling retainers where we're winning contracts, 12, 18-month contracts, where customers are paying a monthly fee, irrespective of the volume of placements uh, uh, below, above a certain number. And then on top of that, any placements they do on top of that, there is a fee for those particular placements. There's also a third fee structure or payment structure on top of that, which is based on three or four key outputs or KPIs related to the quality of the service, speed to hire, et cetera, attention, and so on, those things. So if I was structuring a rolling retained relationship with a customer, it would be a monthly fee to lock them in so they're not going to look anywhere else. It would be a margin on top of that per placement to backfill the number to get it up to our margin that we're looking for. And almost like a bonus metric or based on certain outputs and KPIs that will drive us to deliver a better quality service to them and a quality service that has a significant impact to their profitability and efficiency, which has a monetary value. So if they're going to get better improvements because of it, I want to cut off that as well. And I think if you get a three-tier model like that, then it becomes a proper partnership model, which I think is really well. We know it works. Fantastic, James. A very comprehensive answer there. So thank you. And Tim, hopefully that certainly answers your question. Um, partnership being the main word that uh, stood out for me there, James, towards the end of that answer um, and the engagement that you get with the client. Um, we, we're going to wrap up soon, but just a quick couple of other points I did want to cover with James with you while we've got you on. Um, and that's the social media side of things, because, you know, I follow you on social media. Loads of other people do love the posts, wide variety of content. Um, you know, very incisive, uh, report driven, your 12 point plan, for example, that's just come out, but equally some great stuff, you know, about, you know, various uh, running antics, etc. But, but social media wise, just for a second, you know, what part do you think social media has actually played in terms of keeping us going through COVID? Yeah, so I, I, I absolutely hate social media. And I absolutely love social media. It depends how it's used, right? So on the negative side, um, you know, I'm an observer. I like to observe situations and people and how people respond to stuff. And I've seen some horrendous experiences on social media where people have basically been abusing it and um, knocking people, bullying and that type of stuff. That really, A, it saddens me anyway in a normal sort of way. But in this current climate with what's going on, I don't think people need that right now. So that side of social media I hate because it gives people a voice. That's why I think sometimes people, those sort of people shouldn't have a voice. Um, on the positive side, what it's allowed us to do from a sales and marketing point of view is allowed us to be to get our story out there, to talk about what we're doing. You know, there are more people on social media consuming content now than probably ever before right now with what, what we're doing at the moment. So it's a great opportunity from a marketing and sales point of view. Um, social media, to me, is a platform to demonstrate who you really are, to share ideas, to share positivity, uh, and to be useful and interesting. Um, I think if you do that, you do well on social media. If you don't, I think it's a bit whatever-ish, that type of stuff, to the point where it can go to the negative. The only thing I will say about social media, which does link into my whole thinking around um, what I refer to as feeding the machine, which is the, the link between social media, marketing, and sales, um, we must never forget that marketing social media is part of the sales process. So if you're putting stuff out on social media, Damn sure make, sure, make sure it's got some form of call to action for someone to follow up on and do, because the point of it is to bring people down through a sales funnel and win business. They, they, they are Sales doesn't work, I don't think, without marketing, and marketing doesn't work absolutely without selling. 
yeah, massive point. I think that's a massive point, James, uh, in respect of, you know, social media generally. So thank you for that. Um, and, you know, some people are saying after all this, you know, there's going to be a boom in recruitment. You know, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I was going to be a boom. If I, was, if I knew exactly what was going to happen, we'll, we'll get it right. We're, 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 um, we, we, we've said all along, not all along, we, we've said for a number of weeks that we think it's going to be some form of V-shaped bounce, okay? And this is not our clever predictions. We're trying to be smart. It's just basing what we've been seeing and what we, the people we've been talking to, especially the social economists that we hang out with. Um, so we believe there's going to be a V-shaped bounce. The, uh, the government now are predicting it looks like it's more likely to be a V-shaped bounce than before. Um, it will bounce back to a slightly softer market in some instances, of course, and maybe slightly slower for some instances in some markets, but that's the reality of it. But one thing that's really, really important with this is and you and I were talking about this the other day, and I'm not sure if, how I sort of explain this sometimes if it, goes, if it comes down right. If the market bounces back and it's a U shape or it's a Nike Swiss shape or it's a whatever shape you want to make it, yeah. if it's elongated, as in it's going to take a while for the markets to come back, that doesn't mean you as a business cannot have your own V-shaped bounce at the same time. Because what you've got to remember, if the market is shrinking slightly, there's a lot of recruitment companies that have gone fairly dormant or they've put their heads in the sand over this period. It's going to take them a while to come back if they do come back. In the meantime, the recruiters who are resilient and strong, who are using this time effectively, can bounce back quicker. And because the marketplace will be smaller, the market share opportunity will be bigger for them. So... I'm predicting a V-shaped bounce for smart recruiters if you want to go and run and take that. I can't predict what's going to happen with COVID-19 and whether it's going to cause a W-shape. I can't plan what's happening in China at the moment. I can't plan what's going on in America. These are all going to have implications, right? Of course they are. But I reckon, I'm fairly confident that we can create our own V-shaped bounce if you want to. And therein lies positivity for recruiters. And I think something that recruiters can definitely be positive about. Um, James, thank you so much for today. And in finishing up, you know, we've spoken about and shared our interest in cocktails and rum, uh, et cetera. And I know, you know, when I was looking through some of your posts, you've been uh, expressing your interest in Philadelphia soul and spending a lot of time with your kids. Um, so on a lighthearted note, I suppose, just to end, you know, what other things have you been doing to keep yourself happy and positive during this time? Well, there's two sides to it, okay? And this is going to, one side is going to sound like a real facetious thing to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, I'm actually really enjoying this period because when we set this business up, we were a purpose-driven business and we are out to make a positive difference. That's what we said. That's why we wrote values on the wall and that sort of thing. And I think, I like to think that we've demonstrated that and we're carrying on demonstrating that. That's why we offered our services for free to the recruitment market um, over this period. And I think, we've made a good difference to a lot of people. So that keeps me going. That keeps me happy. That keeps me excited because you, know, you can't not feel good about yourself when you're making a positive difference. On the flip side of that, apart from I do enjoy probably a little bit too much uh, red wine and rum at the moment, not, not together, but pretty close together. Um, it, yeah, it's the physical side. I'm, I'm loving running again. And as, as I mentioned to you the other day, you know, we moving into this January the 1st to mid-March I think I ran about 120 kilometers over the course of that sort of 10 week period which is great yeah um, in the last 10 weeks since lockdown I've tripled that I've done about 370 kilometers in the same period so that's cool right I mean that's pretty good so it's a lot there's a lot of good things and good habits coming out of this that you know I don't want to lose those they're great and they keep me happy um good habits positivity James thank you so much for today and um, you've so, shown like, a lot of specifics as well for people who've asked questions. Um, so thank you again, James, much appreciated. Um, and to the audience, thank you very much for tuning in and listening today. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the Crowdcast. Um, we will be back in three weeks time on the 24th of June with Kevin Green looking at the shape of the recruitment industry post COVID. Thank you and have a great day. Take care for now.